Hello, Brooklyn. Thank you so much for joining us for our first live stream show of Navy Our Neighbor. I am your co-host, Julia Weeks. I will bring be bringing along um, our second co-host in just a minute. I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. If you could let us know where you're watching from in the comments, we would greatly appreciate it. As I said, this is our first live show. Um, my partner and I, uh, Isra Pennon, who will be coming on shortly, decided to start this endeavor uh, a couple years ago. We started an Instagram page, um, instagram.com slash Navy Yard Neighbor. We, uh, we moved into the Navy Yard around 2016. Uh, the Navy Yard is an area in Brooklyn, New York. It's on the border of Fort Greene and um, Clinton Hill, right by the water. It is a um, beautiful area right along the water path. Um, I'm sorry, right along the bike path. And, and it is still an active uh, loading dock. And so I uh, bought a condo here in 2016 and uh, shortly after would go on to meet uh, Isra, my partner in life, my love of my life and a partner in crime. And so uh, that's kind of how this story began. And as we lived in the Navy Yard, um, we just wanted to learn so much about the history here. And uh, we went on our tour, or I'm sorry, our guests, who are Cindy and Andrew, who I will be bringing on shortly, uh, their tours of the Navy Yard to learn more about the history of the neighborhood. So um, without further ado, I'd like to bring my co-host, Isra Pananon, on. Hi, Isra, how are you? <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, hey, partner in crime. Um, thanks for... Thanks for tagging me to do this. I'm really excited. Thank you so much. So as um, some of you know, and some of you don't know, we do have a one bedroom here in the in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So I'm at the kitchen table and uh, Isra's in the bedroom. So we're not sure how the uh, audio quality is gonna be, but we are testing it out. So uh, without further ado, we want to bring on our guests, Cindy and Andrew of Turnstile Tours. Um, so here they are. Hey guys. Hey everybody. Hey. How are you guys doing? We're good. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on. I know um, we saw you, um, it's been months now, I feel like, since everything's yeah. been closed and um, just want to catch up with you and, and, you know, learn about how you guys are doing. Um, but I wanted to share kind of one of our first experiences um, with Turnstile Tours was before I moved into the Navy Yard and actually did um, your programming, you had a great uh, fall photography tour um, of the of the Navy Yard. So I, I did that with you guys and just loved that and got hooked ever since. And so then did a bike tour and then brought on Isra uh, for some other walking tours of the Navy Yard. And we, lo we love what you guys do. So Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And I'm going to kind of pop behind the scenes and post some questions and let Isra um, talk to the two of you about how things are going. So I will chat with you guys in a little bit. Here's All right. You. Thanks, Julia. Thanks. Yeah, so to piggyback off what Julia said, um, you know, as a former Department of the Interior uh, employee and now alumni, um, I've always been fascinated with place-based history and preserving stories um, for for our future generations, right? And that includes uh, diverse and uh, inclusive stories. Um, and thank you so much for uh, doing what you do, right, to tell the whole whole history of the the United States, um, you know, mainly here in the in Brooklyn, but um, I'm really, really fascinated with what you guys do, and thank you so much for what you do. So let's get started by telling us a little bit um, about who you guys are and about your company. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can start. Um, so I'm, I'm Andrew Gustafson. Uh, yeah, and so um, we started working together. Uh, well, I should say that we are both partners in business <laughs> as well as in life. Um, and so, yeah, we've we've uh, been working together now for about 12 years, I guess. Um, so wow. before I started uh, developing and, and giving tours uh, in New York City, uh, I, and before we met, I was actually living um, in Colorado. I was getting my uh, PhD in geography. Um, so I kind of approached this more from the sort of academic research background. I did not finish my PhD, by the way. Um, and uh, it's okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so, and so that's kind of the, the direction and the approach, um, that I take to, to our work, but Cindy, if you, Cindy's the one who, she's our president and she's the one who actually started the company. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I worked in the museum field for many years. I'm originally from just outside of Flint in Michigan. 
Um, moved to New York in 2003 after living in Russia for a couple of years uh, after undergrad and um, worked at various different museums. Um, so I sort of cut my teeth on tours at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, ended up managing programs there. And then um, for several years was doing some consulting with cultural institutions around the city and uh, really desired to tell stories and, and take that museum style rigor that you have in cultural institutions and take that to non-traditional places to elevate stories that are underrepresented in the public record. And so how the, the company and our work got started was really um, this, this idea of, of creating programming that would be you know, with different community organizations. And there was an opportunity in 2008 when the Brooklyn Navy Yard started thinking about having a cultural institution, having what is the visitor and exhibition and employment center today. Um, and so we were brought on board initially by the Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. And it was that opportunity that prompted our incorporation as a company. Um, and so that's that's how that's how it got started. Um, and then in 2012, um, we sort of reincorporated as a social enterprise, a, a benefit corporation, um, which was new legislation in New York State. It's a new kind of, of business model um, that's focused on social responsibility. And so all of our tours are in partnership with different nonprofit organizations in New York City. Yeah. So the Navy Yard. Uh, we did our first tour there. Or Cindy did the first tour there in like October of 2008. So now we're approaching 12 years of doing programs, and I, I have to look back at our at our numbers. But I think we've had like 40, 50 thousand visitors or something on guided tours of the Navy Yard. So um, it's still our biggest program, um, but you know we've expanded to a lot of other um, you know non-traditional sites and working with a lot of different nonprofit partners to do. To do guided tours. Yeah, and I mean, in everything we do, you know, our focus is really on advancing public knowledge about the meaning of place and connecting people with one another, engaging people's stories. So we don't want these tours to just be us storytelling. We want to invite people to share their own stories. And in many cases, we also document those stories as part of our work. Um, and we want to make sure that all the educational programming and resources we put out into the world um, are accessible and engaging for people. So that's that's really, that's what mm -hmm. we do. And, and it's all with different nonprofits that are otherwise maybe not have the capacity to do this kind of um, public programming. Yeah, thank you so much for that, the, the lovely introduction. And I think the first thing I noticed is when we when I did the tour of the Navy Yard with you guys and we went through the dry docks, the first thing you t uh, asked the tour group was like, tell us a little bit about yourself, your name, you know, where you come from, what you're interested in. And it was really, uh, really, really engaging, more so than like your normal tour. You really like dug deep in, uh, to the folks that were on the tour and why they were there. Um, and I, I really, really just love that aspect of engaging with each other. So let's get a little bit deeper into your tours. I know you guys sent us um, a lot of photos and some videos, so I definitely want to, you know, dig deep into that. And so, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, kind of the kind of tours you do? Um, yeah, and any uh, particular cool stories you might have to share? Yeah, well, to to your point, Isra, I, I just wanted to mention something that you know the visitors that we have on the tours are totally integral um, to the actual experience and. Um, to what we do, and, and that's really because number one, you know, with a place like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you could spend a lifetime um, telling stories about that place. And so we really wanna make sure that every tour that we do um, is in some way tailored uh, to people's interests. People come for all sorts of different reasons, all different backgrounds and, and interests. Um, but the other part of it too is that so many people that come on our tours, especially at the Navy Yard, have personal connections. I mean, we every tour that we give, almost without exception, um, people have a personal connection to the place. Maybe they worked or served there themselves or have a family member who did. Uh, and so we, we learned so much. So like Cindy said before, you know, we want to try and document people's stories. And, and so many of the people that have had their stories preserved in the oral history archive at the Brooklyn Navy Yard are people who actually, they first just came on a tour. Um, and that experience just sparked memories for them and, and we were able to, to share that. And so I, you know, I learn new things every single time I give a tour. 
And something that's so special about it is um, people, you know, women who were defense workers during World War II or people who came in and, and maybe they worked for a couple of years at the Brooklyn Navy Yard at some point in time, when they come on these experiences, they become kind of the rock stars, you yeah. know, it's really special. Like we've had people come um, on, on their birthdays. We had a woman whose oral history, we play on a lot of tours, Carmela Zuza, who came on her 90th birthday with her niece. Oh. And it was, you know, it's those kinds of experiences that that mean so much that we're we're documenting and sharing their stories. And and Carmela came in 2014, and that was the first time she had been back to the yard uh, since 1945. Um, so that was a really really special. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Really we, have, we we have some some photos of some of these folks that we can share too. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's get to. It. I think Julia's going to put them. Oh, there we oh, go. These two love birds. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Cindy insisted in putting in a picture of like one of our first dates. Well, so. that's yeah, yeah. Come on now. So I, I, I just thought it might be fun to share how we met because this is like the story that all our friends prompt us to to share. Yeah. Um, and so we, um, I was working at the Tenement Museum and uh, did an interview for Russian television. And at the time, so I also speak Russian. I lived in Russia for a number of years, and so at the time, I told you, do. I told you guys. So, uh, which is this picture is appropriate. This is a, a Russian um, banya bathhouse um, in Sheepshead Bay that we often go to uh, on um, on Graves and Neck Road. But uh, anyway. So I was living in Russia, um, working as a reporter at the time. And uh, yeah, so this documentary came on where they interviewed Cindy uh, in, in Russian about working at the Tent Museum. And so- uh, Three visits that, later. Three, yeah. <laughs> so then about six months after that, I moved back to, to the States and then visited the Tenement Museum more than once before we, before we met. And uh, yeah, the rest is, is history, I guess. Yeah, so. now we get tours together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was meant to be, meant to be. Yeah. Uh, I think this picture, this is from one of the, uh, it might be the first um, World War II history tour that we gave. Um, so that's a, one of our most popular programs. Um, we started those in 20, uh, 2012. Um, and yeah, it just really goes deep into that period from 1941 to 1945, which is really the most transformative period in the history of the Navy Yard. You know, many of the buildings and the actual ground that the Navy Yard is on was built um, during the Second World War when about 70,000 people, uh, civilian workers, um, were based at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So um, it's really, really popular. Lots of people have personal connections just because of the sheer number of people that work there. You know, 70,000 at any time, um, but you know, people left jobs, people got drafted. So you're talking about actually several hundred thousand individuals that um, you know connected with the Navy Yard in some way during World War II, and then think about all their kids and grandkids and great grandkids. So um, that's uh, that, that's a really really popular popular program. Yeah, I just I can't imagine all I mean, that amount of civilians working in the Navy Yard at that time because now. Well, maybe that the, there are numbers there, but it, it was it's just so different, right? That's how, how what was the number you said? So seventy thousand. But it, it's interesting yeah. to say that. So so right now the Navy Yard um, uh, employs about twelve thousand people across um, almost five hundred different businesses. Uh, so for folks, if they not familiar with the Navy Yard, you know, so it was a, a federal naval shipyard from. Uh, 1801 until 1966, and then it was decommissioned and sold to the city of New York. So today it's a 300 acre um, industrial park that's owned by the city and it's run by a nonprofit. And so, so right now the, the workforce stands at about 12,000. You know, if we project forward with the Navy Yard's master plan over the next, uh, you know, 15 years or so, 15, 20 years, um, they project that they'll, they'll reach about 35, uh, Right? Is that right? Thirty thousand, at least thirty thousand. Yeah, at least thirty thousand people working there. Now, when we talk about the workforce of seventy thousand, um, that's across three shifts. So, at any given time, there are probably about twenty-five to thirty thousand people there. So, you know, in the relatively near future, we'll probably actually see similar job density at the Navy Yard as we saw in World War II. So, 
but we just won't have people working there 24 seven like you did back then. Right. Yep. As uh, as Navy, our neighbors, we're we're excited for the transformation. Uh, I know it's going to bring a lot more uh, interruptions. Maybe not the right word, but uh, yeah, a lot more foot traffic uh, to this area. Yeah. So um, yeah. I know we're going to grow. Hopefully, we responsibly responsibly grow. But uh, yeah, excited for excited for the changes. Um, yeah. So I see this is a uh, your wedding day here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so a this picture. <laughs> yeah, we were we were married in um, Most Holy Trinity St. Mary's. It's a church in Williamsburg um, that we actually had been giving tours of um, mm -hmm. during holiday time as a as a fundraiser um, for the Human Service Center there, and and we did these programs with. Um, a friend of ours who's a, a, a priest and uh, and and actually as part of some of our virtual programs we invited him on recently so that's sort of how we're adapting during this time mm -hmm. yeah this um, so yeah to, to the point um, we were talking about before with with oral history um, so this photo is from uh, 2011. This is the opening. Yeah, of this is the opening of Building 92, which is the visitor and exhibition center for the Navy Yard. Um, so this is where all of our tours are based. Um, this is kind of, um, you know, where it's our jumping off point. Um, so there's a great little museum um, currently closed um, during the pandemic. Uh, but that's really kind of the hub for all the education and cultural programming at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so this is a photo from when it opened in, on Veterans Day in 2011. Um, and this is a guy named Robert Hammond um, who participated in the Oral History Project. We talk about him a lot on our tours and play an oral history of his because um, he was one of the first um, African Americans to enter uh, the um, uh, Medical Corps uh, mm -hmm. of the U.S. Navy uh, back in World War II. Wow, unbelievable. Um, yeah, and I see he's uh, got his eagle globe and anchor right on his hat. So yeah. hoorah, hoorah to all the uh, Marine vets out there. Uh, yeah, it, that's it's such an incredible story, and thank you for capturing that. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the Marines, um, this is a Marine family right here. So this is uh, Barbara and Paul Fields. Um, this is a really amazing story. So this is in the lobby of Building 92, where we have our famous uh, anchor from the USS Austin. Um, but in 1970, what year was it? 74? Yeah, 1974, um, Paul was uh, stationed in Brooklyn with the, with the Marine Corps, uh, and he got married to Barbara, and they, um, you know, were, had to give them married housing, and the only place that was available uh, was actually Building 92. Uh, and so they were actually the last people to live in Building 92. Um, and then in, in 1975, the Marines, you know, left the Navy Yard and they left the receiving station, which is where uh, where you guys, your apartment building, sits on the footprint of the old receiving station. But anyway, we we met them. They live in Hawaii, um, and they just basically wandered in off the street. Um, and they said, you know, uh, we think we're the last people to live in this building. And I was like, I don't think so. That doesn't sound right. Um, but they, they totally were. And, and, uh, that we did an oral history with them and they've, they've come back actually a couple times and we've, we've, you know, uh, just, it was been a real pleasure to, to get to know them and, and have their story as part of our archive. And for those who out there who are, are not so familiar with oral histories, like what do you, what do you do when you, you take someone's oral history? Yeah, I mean, the the main thing I'd say for us is, um, you know, I, I would suggest one of the most challenging things for anyone that's doing an oral history is that it's, it's a very natural thing to say, mm-hmm, and to, to, to kind of convey that you're with the person. <laughs> and so the key is to uh, prepare the person that you're going to interview so that they understand why you're maybe not making the sounds that you're with them because you want to capture their story without those interruptions. So that's something that sometimes you just learn by doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I would say that that's one suggestion. And also in our work, we have found that it's very helpful to share a tour experience for people to bring along family and to revisit some of these sites that um, might spark memories for them. 
Yeah, and you know, some oral history, it's you're you're trying to get the you know that that person's life story on the record. Um, what what we do is is usually very site specific. Um, so we want to find out, you know, what's that person's connection to say the Brooklyn Navy Yard or to the Brooklyn Army Terminal or wherever it is that we're working. Um, but at the same time, you want to get that contextual information. So we always ask people, you know, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Um, even though we might be interested in, you know, that period when they worked as a ship fitter at the Navy Yard or, or that period that they were in the armed forces. So um, it, it, you know, it, it depends on kind of what you're what you're aiming for, you know. Um, you know, now the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, between us and the Yard and the Brooklyn Historical Society, they've been collecting oral histories, you know, some go back to the mid 80s. And so there's there's now well over 100, um, you know, recordings um, that are in the in the archive um, that is. If you're interested, you know, many of them are housed in the Brooklyn Historical Society's website, but we're all, the Navy Yard's also in the process in the future at some point to make those more widely available, digitized. Yeah, and I, I would say also that another important thing when you're interviewing people, I, I think having family members, if they can be present, mm -hmm. is key because um, it may be that you ask about a certain year and uh, it's hard for someone to recall, but other family members can help them with clues or or discuss mm -hmm. things that happened in their in their lives or in the family at that time um to help spark those memories yeah um and you know the the, the thing the main reason why we we do it is number one you know to have these stories for posterity you know most of the people that we interview um oral histories they're in their 80s and 90s um so we want to preserve those stories um but we, we also learn new things all the time you know there's only so much that the official documentation will tell you, uh, you know, and whether it's, you know, looking at government documents, looking at the newspaper of the Navy Yard, there's still lots and lots of, of gaps um, that are there. And so the oral histories really illuminate a completely different side, um, you know, of the lived experience of the Navy Yard. And we're even interested in stories that are after the decommissioning, yeah. you know, the stories of, of people who were working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard when it was a commercial shipyard, a uh, shipbuilding center in the 1970s, um, even into the 1980s. As it's so, that, you know, we're we're interested in stories all across uh, all across that that time period. Yeah. So the Navy, the story of the Navy Yard does not end in 1966. No. no. This year is our, our uh, staff member, Doug, who's been with us almost since the beginning. Um, and he's leading an urban ecology tour. So this is one that we would usually start around this time of year. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, we give tours in other parts of the city as well. So this is uh, uh, in Midtown, we do a tour uh, about street vendor stories and about the street vending industry, everything from where carts and trucks are fabricated to where they go at night to the genuity of the individual vendors and their fam most of them are immigrant families that we work with um and so we're really proud to share their stories and then our partnership is with the street vendor project which is an organization that provides business legal assistance and advocacy support to the street vendors in new york city yeah and just a little plug you can go to their website streetvendor.org um, and they've set up a fund for vendors who are struggling because a lot of them are, are not eligible for various, um, you know, grants and, and government assistance. Um, and they've, you know, had to shut down their businesses for, for the most part. So uh, if you want to uh, visit there and, and and help them out that they've set up a, a GoFundMe. Yeah, that's a, a thank you for putting a plug in. So that I was I was thinking that this time must be extremely, extremely, extremely hard. Um, on all the food vendors, whether it's cart or, you know, restaurants, or whatever, it's brick, brick and mortar. Like, um, you know, I was wondering, like, what can we do to help them? So um, I'll definitely check out the Street Vendor Project, um, you know, and hopefully uh, when we get back into being out and about, uh, take take the tour, because this is uh, one tour we wanted to do. Um, so this is a, a good segue in kind of our next subject was it's really how how the pandemic is affecting your business and how um, you guys are maintaining your resiliency. And, you know, you've obviously shifted a lot of your programming uh, to being virtual now. And so how's that going for you? Uh, yeah, um, it's it's been a struggle. Uh, it's been a challenge. But, um, you know, I, I just want to say that we're really so thankful that we have such a great team. Um, 
that we get to collaborate with every day. Uh, and they've been tremendous um, in helping us adapt to this new reality. And of course, our partners, so the different institutions we work with have also been incredibly supportive and they're dealing with their own you know, issues and struggles. And then of course is our, our customers. Uh, we just had an incredible outpouring of, of support um, whether it's just kind words or you know financial support from from our customers uh, over the last several weeks. So the last time we gave an in-person tour, uh, it's a funny story. It was actually on March 11th uh, when things were were starting to snowball. Uh, we were going to give a tour actually for a for a, a college class, uh, and then at the last minute they decided uh, we're actually just going to broadcast it over FaceTime. <laughs> uh, so just the professor showed up and and held up her phone and, and broadcast it to the rest of the class that way. Um, and so that was sort of a preview of what our reality was, was gonna be like. Um, so, so yeah, um, I don't know, Cindy, if you wanna share kind of how we, we got started with um, online programming. Yeah, I mean, we realized very quickly that um, it wasn't gonna be possible for quite some time to be out. Um, and so uh, giving our tours um, and and so um, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> He's adjusting the lighting as it's getting kind of dark in here. Um, but um, so, so yeah, cool. we in a matter of- You guys of, are pros at this now. So you Pardon? Um, in, a, in a matter of days, we- um, Oh no, go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, in a matter of days, we reached out to all of uh, the different nonprofit organizations we work with and, um, uh, you know, put together a, a slate, a week full of programming, and we decided to do daily virtual programs. So we do them every day at 11 a.m. Today, we did our 51st and 52nd programs. Much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, we usually do the programs in the in the morning. So we're not right. used to the we're lighting. We're not used to lighting. Yeah. Um, but so we do them at 11 a.m. every day, and some of them we're using archival materials. Um, and what's been really interesting is, on one hand, of course, we're sharing some of the stories that we might share on our tours. Uh, but but we've been doing original research and archival research for all the different programs that we offer for many years. And some of those stories um, end up on the cutting room floor because uh, there's no visual cue. There's no, we, we always feel that you have to answer the question, why am I on a tour and not in a lecture hall? Or why am I in a tour? Why am I in this place? And so if there isn't sort of something to visually engage you. So we've been using archival materials for some of the programs, but we've also interviewed street vendors, um, some of whom are in their homes. Um, market vendors uh, from Essex Market, which is um, one of the public markets here in New York City. So that's another kind of cluster of programs that we offer. Um, some of those vendors are actually in business right now. So in some cases, we've broadcasted live uh, to their stalls um, to kind of update people on what they have to offer and how to support them. Um, Prospect Park Alliance has been a great partner mm -hmm. for us. So that's another cluster of tour programs that we have. Um, and we've brought on um, all different kinds of guests from their staff. Uh, and, and so it's just, it's been, a, it's been an opportunity to share stories of, of what, what our nonprofit partners are doing and the work that they do uh, to make New York City such a, a unique place to live and work, um, but also small businesses, um, artists, uh, and people who are isolated at home and 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 are are happy and grateful to have the opportunity to share the work that they do day in and day out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know it was. Uh, we're, well, we're, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, you know, you? I got to hate that. From Sorry, I seem to be cutting out here. Well, that's okay. Um, go ahead with that thought, Andrew. Oh, I was just going to say that um, you know we're we're learning every day, uh, so we've been tweaking things, um, oh. learning how to use different platforms. Uh, you know, 
we, we had to completely overhaul our website and our ticketing system to go virtual. And, you know, we kind of stood the whole thing up in 36 hours. Um, and now we're having to go back and fix things. Um, but people have been super understanding um, and very uh, generous with their constructive feedback for how we can make this work better. So, so it's been, it's been really great. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, it's the reality that we're all living in. Right. So I think people understand. So we have staff members with toddlers at home yeah. and they, they want to do programs. Um, you know, we have one staff member who um, uh, also has a husband who, who's teaching at the same time in the room next door. And there's one moment in our early programs where we realized we could hear his voice in the background. And she had sort of a green screen behind her. So what she did is she picked up her computer and moved into her laundry room and shut the door. Yeah, <laughs> so when you couldn't tell, like, the lighting changed, which you couldn't necessarily tell. <laughs> she was yeah. We've had internet go down, so we're interviewing an artist. Her internet went down three times, <laughs> but it was okay. Like, it yep. actually, the program turned out fine. Like <laughs> yeah, we've taken full advantage of the virtual background feature on Zoom, so <laughs> yeah. we, we can be anywhere with, with that. So, yeah, it's been a learning experience, but... <laughs> <laughs> definitely feel you know after seven weeks now of, of doing this that we're we're sort of getting into a rhythm and um, you know hopefully building more more of an audience and, and reaching people that we would never be able to reach otherwise because you know you have to come to New York City you know to experience one of our programs normally so yeah yeah that's that's a really really good point uh, what I was saying before is that I, I hate that phrase you know you're making lemonade out of lemons, but this is what it really is. And so I'm curious to know, um, I'm sure you'll go back you know, to doing uh, your actual tours outdoors, but do you think you'll continue with the virtual print programming in addition to being you know, in, the, in the actual spaces? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think we've, we've learned a lot in this experience and it's something we've been discussing with our staff. Um, because we have people who are watching from, in some cases, other parts of the world, um, other parts of the country, who might not, and let's face it, after um, this pandemic, uh, there may be people that might not be able to uh, afford to travel in the way that perhaps they could mm -hmm. in the past. Um, and so we do see real potential for that. And And I would say, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is the value of just maintaining a sense of community and and meaning in our daily lives and and continuing to share the stories that we, that we care about so much and share people's stories um and and their talents and and over time we're kind of building a community so there's even one guy he's watched almost every day and as we were preparing to do the program on our anniversary last weekend um, uh, about the church where we were married with that with that priest that I talked about. Um, we got an email from our viewer in advance with family photos and his ancestors um, had been had had personal connection. He had personal connections to the church. And so we invited photos. And so you know, over time you start to build this sense of community in a digital way. Yeah, and yeah. so we, you know, we do a forty-five to sixty-minute program every day, um, and on the weekends we do two shows at eleven, and then another one at four. Um, so I don't think we'll we'll be able to maintain that, you know, if we're back up actually operating <laughs> our in-person tours. But maybe you know, we <laughs> we know that we want to continue um, connecting with people in that way. Uh, and the other thing that's been so incredible about this is, you know, we've gotten so many amazing people to come on during this time, many of whom we probably couldn't get to come on a tour or to do a program normally. Um, just people are, are so busy. Uh, and so now not only have we been able to get them on these programs, but we, we've we also recorded them. And so, you know, that's also things that we can share with our, with our um, you know, our community, but also with our staff, um, you know, and, and we just, we've, we've learned new things because now all of a sudden, instead of, you know, let's say it's, you know, someone who works at the Navy Yard, we're doing normally like a, maybe a, a 20 minute visit with them on a tour. Now we can sit down with them for an hour and they're talking to us and, and showing us whether they're an artist showing, you know, their, their process, or uh, it's a business owner who's kind of walking them through, walking us through their factory or whatever. Um, we, we've actually 
learned so much and connected with, with new people that under normal circumstances, you know, people just don't have time in the same way. Um, and so that's been, that's been really, really amazing. And that's especially true at a place like the, the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard where you have mostly small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be uh, one or two staff members or maybe 10 staff members, but um, by doing the digital program, you provide this opportunity, this window into their work that we can't necessarily take people through all these spaces. Oh, so now we're seeing some of these are just highlights. These are screenshots of this, programs that we did. This right here, this was uh, actually uh, two of our best attended programs. The slide before was one that we did with the forest ecologist of um, Prospect Park Alliance, uh, Howard Goldstein. The amazing thing about that is, we, you know, we just reached out to him uh, if you do a program, he's like, oh, I, I did this great presentation for the Prospect Park Alliance staff. So maybe I could just do that. So we basically were like, yeah, let's do it. Like basically everybody got to be like a, in a staff meeting essentially and, and get that kind of insider information. Uh, and then the one after we did a program again with the park and with the Brooklyn Historical Society uh, for Census Day to uh, encourage people to fill out their census uh, forms back on on April first. So that, that was a that was a really interesting program. And both of those, so some of the programs we're doing are free, especially like you know with those, it's really a yeah. public service. We want as many people to come fill out their census forms as possible. Um, and so we have been doing uh, at least like one or two a week that are that are free. Um, and, and there, you know, there was another one that we did uh, about manufacturing that mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of raise awareness about the role that manufacturing plays in New York City, because especially in this moment, we all understand uh, that that sort of pain point with the need for PPE production. So this was another kind of public service free program we did with uh, Mohammed Atia, who's the uh, executive director of the Street Vendor Project. So he talked your exact question, Isra, what, what can you do to help? Uh, that's, that was the title of the program. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we did that back in uh, early April or late, late March. Yeah. That was one of our early programs. Yep. We, we started as soon as this started to happen, we got on the phone and called all the different street vendors that we work with just to check in with them. And, yep. and we, you know, this is a way that people can help. Mm -hmm. I think. You guys, uh, I love these pictures, and you guys are master community organizers. Um, you know, I love it. And, you know, it's interesting to me, like, the first thing you thought about when all this went down was uh, how can you help other people and other businesses, you know, and, uh, rather than uh, yourself. So, um, well, you, know, well, you, guys, I mean, you guys got big hearts. Well, <laughs> we wouldn't have a business without these people. You know, it, the, the partnerships is, is really the foundation of, of our whole business and our approach. So, you know, if uh, if we don't have the vendors, if we don't have um, the street vendor project, if we don't have you know our really really great partners at places like Prospect Park Alliance and the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So um, yeah, that was the literally that. Uh, so I think we did our last tour on the 11th. Uh, that was a Wednesday, I guess, and then the following Monday, um, whatever date that was. We, we just spent all day on the phone. We just called up every single person. We're like, okay, it looks like we're going to have to stop tours. Like this, this is what we want to do. Uh, and everybody was like totally on board um, and has really helped us a lot with, um, you know, with, with building out the schedule for the virtual program. Yeah. So. And, and this is just an example of a, one of the programs where this is our staff member, Amanda, and she's sharing the history of street vending um, that this is old traditional Polish uh, so they are uh, actually you can you can still sort of order for them from them. You can order pierogies, for example, that you then um, can prepare mm -hmm. at home. And they did a cooking class um, from their family kitchen. So if you look at the next slide, um, they did a program with us where they wow. cooked a full traditional Polish meal in about a half an hour. Yeah. It was incredible. That's and pretty rad. <laughs> this here is Jack Beller, and his father was the um, person. He, his father, founded a company that essentially invented the stainless steel hot dog cart. 
And this company is still, it's, um, I mean, the name has changed of the business, but it's 800 by cart and they still fabricate carts and trucks out in Queens in Ozone Park. And so he came on to share his family story um, as, as well as the fact that he grew up in this industry. Yeah. And then this is um, another one of the carts that we work with. This is Quick Meal on Midtown and Waffles and Ningus. Um, and both of those um, proprietors have, have come on the, the program. So we had Nasir who uh, works at Quick Meal and then Thomas DeGeese, who's the founder of uh, Waffles and Ningus. We've done a number of programs about the Essex market uh, and the other public markets like Cindy mentioned. And this is Adam Schneider, who's the director of the market. And this is... Uh, Julian Bach, who runs um, Valley Shepherd Creamery, um, which is a cheese store in the market. This is uh, Michaela Grubb, and she's the founder of Riverdale, and she did a, a yesterday um, made a, a vegan breakfast sandwich um, in her kitchen for us. Um, and and this here is uh, Christina uh, Saeed, and um, from from the Chinatown Ice Cream Factory, and they're actually open. You can see. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is the live captioning. So we've had one staff member behind the scenes type in and you can see that text across the bottom of the screen. Yeah. There. Yeah. So she sort of shared, she said, well, you know, one thing that everybody probably needs in this time, comfort food, is ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> so we just wanted to share this. This was actually, a, a, this is just a little clip so people get a taste. This is um, our very first program. Uh, which was called Inventions of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, so we did it back on March 19th. Um, and one of the inventions of the Navy Yard is something called a stanky hood. So this was the main uh, uh, safety device um, for escaping a submarine um, from the early 1960s through the 1990s. Uh, so what Cindy's doing, normally you would pump this up with a scuba tank, but she's pumping it up with a bicycle pump uh, and so I, I have it on. I bought this on, on eBay many years ago, and we actually use it for some of our, our uh, STEM uh, programs at the Navy Yard to show people how, how they work. Yeah, that was our very first program. Yeah. We, and then oh, later that so week, fun. we did one. Another thing that we use for our, our programs, um, especially for, for kids, uh, is I, I built this model of a dry dock um, to explain the principle of how it works. And so normally what we do is we have this tub set up at the dry dock. So you can see the real ship repair facility at the Navy Yard, and then you can see a model. But we can't do that anymore, so we had to set it up in our bathtub. Yeah. Uh, so we did a whole run. We did the whole activity uh, on on camera, broadcast live, and uh, and should explain to people how, how a dry dock works. I, I just love that you've totally improvised and you're using <laughs> Your, your personal space to do all of these things. I mean, yeah. we're getting really close, close and intimate here in your home here. And uh, how was it with that uh, hood on? Could you breathe? Uh, the life yeah, vest thing? Well, you know, explain how a yeah. whole breathing apparatus works, but it's very uncomfortable and very hot. Yeah, I mean, in the video, and actually when we filmed it, I kept at checking in with him, like, can you breathe? Yeah. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Can you breathe? <laughs> well, so one, one thing that we've tried to do is think about, okay, who are people that we know that are sheltering in place in places that are more interesting than our apartment? Uh, and so we actually, this the previous slide, um, one of our staff members, uh, Stefan uh, Dreisbach Williams, uh, he actually lives in the Bound House in Flushing, Queens, which was built in 1661. It's the oldest building in New York, or second, second sorry, second oldest building in New York State. Uh, and he's the caretaker. So he lives there. So we're like, let's do a tour of the Bound House. Uh, and so we're actually doing that on, on Tuesday. So he's gonna he's gonna show uh, show us around there, uh, which will be which will be cool. So I think we just I have. I love a all of this. Yeah, yeah. this this is. Oh, uh, oh, more. Yeah. So um, we mentioned this program before. This was again one of our best attended and and really such a fascinating program. Um, if you go to our website, uh, you can you can watch it. Um, this is with Adam Friedman, another Navy Yard neighbor, because uh, he's the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. 
Um, and so he gave a presentation about the state of manufacturing in New York City today, um, just generally speaking, but then also talking about how companies have pivoted um, in the time of pandemic, not only you know pivoted because they've had to shut down and seek assistance and things like that, but also companies that are you know making medical equipment, making personal protective equipment, um, stuff like that. And a lot of those companies are, are in the Navy Yard, as, as people may be aware. And this here is, um, so we've had artists as well yep. um, come on the program. And this here is Michelle Green. Um, and she's a, a sculptor um, and a metal artist that's based inside the Brooklyn Navy Yard. She's done all kinds of public art. Um, and you can see this little house here where the materials that she used actually came from the building where her studio is located. She also designed this public park where in normal times, um, workers in the yard would gather together and sit at that table, which you can see is a ship door yep. that she salvaged from inside the Navy Yard. So a lot of her work draws from the materials in the yard and she's been there for over 25 years. Yeah, um, I see a question here from, from Stefan. Uh, the name of the the piece of equipment I used is a Steinke hood, so it's S T I E N. No, S T E I. Uh, sorry, S T E I N K E, not not Spanky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then hold hold a, up, hold yeah. Up. yeah. <laughs> And this is Tatiana Arocha, who's inside the Navy Yard. She's originally from Colombia. So the program that we did with her, she talked about her up, up, upbringing in Colombia. And her father's an anthropologist, so she spent time in the rainforest. And so much of the, she creates these beautiful murals, which you can see here. Um, and, uh, and, and talked about sort of the inspiration of the rainforest in her work. Mm -hmm. But then she also did kind of a hands-on project. So this was our first foray into art making. Um, and then we had subsequently several other artists come on, including um, Nick Golbievsky, who we can see here. Um, this is his studio in the Navy Yard. And he did, in the next photo, you can see there's a sketching activity. So we learned to kind of spotlight the camera and, yeah. um, and show, he did sort of a live sketch and invited other people at home to sketch what they see. Yes, yeah, so there's a quick drawing uh, workshop. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really fun. And then we worked um, with a, a art, another artist in the Navy Yard. Uh, oh, this is a uh, Millie, Millie Benson. Millie Benson. Um, and she made these amazing. She she likes to make uh, artwork of celestial bodies. Well, this is like her project planets. right yeah. now, yeah, like yeah. since December. And here's a video of her kind of showing what people can do at home, inspired by her work. So it's pretty simple. You know, she just takes objects from around her home. Um, and you'll see she's going to use a, uh, a roll of tape uh, and a water-soluble marker um, to make a circle. And then she's just going to take a spray, a bottle. spray bottle just of, of water, uh, and you'll see the kind of effect that it creates. I really, it was so... Uh, incredible speaking with her just you can kind of see that there and so now it's starting to look like yeah. some kind of spooky planet yeah I mean it, it, it the her artwork just it really felt like it took you to another place yeah it was yeah. it was really a, a nice program and I think in this next um, there was another artist, oh, oh, the Brooklyn Grange. So this yep. past week we hosted one of the founders of uh, Brooklyn Grange Rooftop Farm, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of three far rooftop farms that they operate here in New York City. Um, and yeah, they, they, you know, it was it was such a pleasure. We usually um, sublease space from them in the Navy Yard. Yeah, so uh, our, our office, in, so you see this picture right here um, and then, uh, basically just out of frame um, on the right corner of the building there, that, that's our office in building three on the 11th floor. So we, we share that office space with the Brooklyn Grange. And then of course your guys' house is, is to the left right across the street. Yeah. Ah, never knew you guys had an office up there. I always assumed uh, that was you know somewhere outside of the Navy Yard. Yeah, no, uh, we've had our offices in the Navy Yard now for Two years. I recommend years? it I for remember. any family business if you can have uh, a space outside a of your home between your home life 
and your work life. I mean, now we're back to where we were. Right. <laughs> but it is, I highly recommend as your business grows, you know, we have seven, there are seven of us on our team and it's essential to have yeah. a, a workspace. So uh, I'm getting a signal here from Julia. I uh, wanted to ask, um, so now we know where you work physically, um, where can we find you online? Um, and how can we contact you guys for tours? Or I know you said you guys are doing them every day, but like, wh yeah, where can we find you guys? Yeah, so you can see the link at the bottom of the screen. So if you go to our website, turnstyletours.com, uh, right at the top of the page, so there's a link to uh, go to our virtual programs. Uh, and so, um, you can connect with us in, in a couple different ways. So like, like I said, we do uh, a couple free programs every week uh, and we host those on Facebook Live. So you can follow us on, on Facebook, uh, just facebook.com slash turnstile tours. Uh, um, or you can sign up for individual uh, programs. So the ones that aren't free, we usually charge five bucks um, for the program. Um, or uh, what a lot of our customers do is, is we have a, what's called our all access pass. Um, and so that gives you access to every program every day. Um, but then you can also watch an archive of recordings of past programs as well. Uh, so those are some of the ways that you can follow us. And then you know we're also posting a lot of stuff um, on social media related to our work. So you can find us on Twitter and, and Instagram as, as well as Facebook. Um, and then you can also go to our blog um, on our website where, um, you know, over the last many, many years, uh, we've posted lots of uh, articles and, and writing um, about our research if you want to, you know, really dig deep about the Navy Yard too, especially. So we have tons and tons of, of research and, and writing. Um, I just finished an article that I posted yesterday that's about connections between the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and the Falklands War. Um, you know, we have articles about, you know, oral histories um, with audio clips and things from, from different people we've interviewed in the past. So um, there's lots and lots of stuff on there too. And and, and some of our uh, upcoming programs that yeah, are late. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so tomorrow we're doing Animals of Prospect Park, the history of animals um, and the bound house as Andrew mentioned. And then this Wednesday, we're gonna focus on the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a case study for looking at stormwater and wastewater management and our waterways mm -hmm. here in New York, the cleanliness of our waterways in New York City. Um, we also have exciting um, announcement. Which well, we is, have another Navy Yard program on Friday yes. as well, where we're gonna talk to the, um, the collections manager for the South Street Seaport. Um, and we're gonna look at some items that they have that relate to Brooklyn Navy Yard history. Uh, but yeah, the big, and May 16th. the big exciting news is May 16th, uh, we're gonna have on Jennifer Egan, uh, the author of Manhattan Beach, uh, which is a novel wow. in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in World War II. Uh, it's funny, the last in-person tour that I personally led uh, was on March 1st, and it was a tour of the Navy Yard with Jennifer Egan. Uh, and so now we've come full circle and now she's gonna come on our program and, and do a, a virtual virtual tour with us. So we're gonna talk about, you know, I, I had the opportunity to help her with uh, some of the research on the book. Um, so we're going to, you know, talk about her writing process, but we're also going to listen to oral histories from some of the actual women um, that inspired um, the book and the stories in the book. You know, one if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. You can go to our website and find a link to buy the book from a local bookstore as well. Um, so uh, you can avoid buying it on Amazon. Um, but you can, um, you know, when when I read the book, basically everything that happened in the Navy Yard, I'm like, oh, that's Carmela. Oh, you know, that's, that's Audrey Sylvia. Lyons. Oh, that's Audrey. Like, it's <laughs> like, you know, you know, these people um, because we've, um, you know, listened to their, their stories so many times. Well, uh, well, I definitely got to pick up a copy of the book. I've been wanting to read it for a long time. And uh, I just want to say uh, now Julia's back on that. Um, thank you so much for doing what you do, for making um, your programs affordable, uh, for making them inclusive, for making them run the gamut of subjects from environment to just people to Navy Yard to Brooklyn to all these uh, cool subjects. And uh, even see, even Stefan says, you guys are so cool. Thank you for the, your incredible work. We can tell how passionate you both are. Um, yeah, and lastly, thank you for sharing your passion with us. Um, really, really appreciate it. And thank you. We are so honored to be on your inaugural live stream. We miss you both 
so we much. Miss you too. We would love to see you IRL as soon as we can. <laughs> you guys are such great supporters, um, not only of us but of of everything at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, all the all the programming and, and community outreach. So you guys are also great great boosters of the yard. It's it's such a great and an important place, um, you know, because it supports you know good quality. Uh, jobs for for local people. Um, so we, we just want to thank you guys and thanks so much for for putting together this this program as well. Thank you guys so much for coming on. We'd love to have maybe um, one one show in the future the um, archivist over at the Navy Yard because from my understanding um, our building is where the brig used to be. The um, so your building sits that that entire block um, at Flushing and, and Vanderbilt um, <laughs> that was the receiving station. So. Oh. It was built in 1941. So if you were inducted into the Navy, if you were getting transferred, if you were heading out of the Navy, uh, that's that's where you'd stop. So there were about 3,000 beds in that building. Oh, wow. And it operated all the way up until 1975. Part of that building was the brig, for sure. <laughs> uh, but then after 1975, after the Marines left, um, that building, I think, was first taken over by the city. It was a jail for an extended period of time. Um, so that was really the last use of the building before it was torn down and then, you know, the Navy Green um, apartments were built. So it's not haunted at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you know, the, the oral history we did with Paul and Barbara Fields, they, they talked about, because that's that's where Paul worked every day, was, was in that building, and talks about escorting people to the brig and, and other, other work that he had to do there as a, as a young Marine Corps officer. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting spot. We, we've been trying to find, we, we have a handful of photos of the inside of the building, but you know, it used to have like a, a ballroom. It had these amazing murals inside of the Navy Yard. Uh, but you know, all that's that's gone now. Yeah, so. it's fascinating. We love it. We love we love the history, and we just love the community in our neighborhood. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to kind of start this project and dive into live streaming. And um, we thought, you know, you two, there would be no better first guest. So we're just I'm so I'm happy. Really honored. Yeah. All your friends. So thank you guys so much. And um, we got one more comment. We'll share. Um, it looks like Jonathan from the East Village. He says interesting programming. And um, he's going to talk to his father, I guess. Oh, he says, shall tell a friend of mine whose father worked at the Navy Yard. So hopefully yeah. our, our friends and colleagues who are watching can share the word um, about Turnstile Tours, turnstiletours.com, and at Turnstile Tours on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So please visit them for virtual tours currently and um, go in person when you can. Hopefully that won't be too far away. So you guys, please stay safe, be well, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, you Thank too. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye, everybody.